I want to introduce the director of Candyman, Mr. Bernard Rose. No tripping. Next, the man who uh, who has been he's been killed wonderfully in a couple of Clive Barker pen films, Mr. Ted Ramey. And another man who uh, didn't fare so well in Candyman, Mr. Xander Berkeley. And last but not least, I think we have to say it five times, don't we? Oh, yeah. Candyman, 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 Candyman. Candyman. So I'm going to start off with a couple of questions and then we're going to give it to you guys to ask. So uh, for Bernard, first off, I rewatched this movie uh, to brush up on my, my candy manage and I, I just was blown away by the visuals that you did for this film and how you kind of like we talked previously about how the Cabrini Green Complex looked like a, a beehive. Um, what, what were you going for and how did you design this movie and, and how visually this was so impactful? Well, I mean, uh, it's, it's a real place, Cabrini Green, or it was. It, it was knocked down about uh, 10 years ago, maybe more. Um, I mean, in, so in a sense, the, the, the design of the movie came out of the actual architecture uh, of the location. I mean, I, I have a, a, a huge belief that, especially when you're trying to frighten people, that it has to be anchored in reality. And for me, um, in the modern world, the, the arena of the Gothic house with the you know Victorian gargoyles, that's not frightening. That's just like Disney. <laughs> um, and uh, and that you know, when I, on the other hand, when I first went into Cabrini Green, when I was first shown around by people from the Illinois Film Office, and I went in there, in order even just to walk around the place, you had to have a police or escort. And I thought, well, you know, if you're going to actually frighten people, it's better if you said it somewhere that was genuinely frightening, and it, because it was genuinely dangerous. And I think it, you know, the fact that. That the idea that within our cities there were places where people were living with children and living normal lives, but yet were considered so dangerous by the police that you could not walk in there without a police escort, A, says a lot about our society, and B, says a lot about what the real nature of fear is, because obviously the danger itself was exaggerated, because the danger was based on an irrational fear. And what the, the irrational fear, which was in the original short story, was an irrational fear of poverty. Um, and of course, when I transferred that into an American context in Chicago and went looking for locations, looking for you know public housing that was in a poor state, then of course, it also was a, a, a division that, that, that went along racial lines as well. And so to me, from just looking for something that, you know, what is the essence of racism is irrational fear. And that then, given the actual reality of, of Cabrini Green sitting there right by downtown Chicago, uh, that context gave the film um, more resonance than it would have done if you were just trying to say, here's a suburban subdivision or here's um, a gothic house. And, you know, in that sense, modernist architecture, which was the dream of, like, the Bauhaus group in Germany in the 20s, and the idea of being that it would be a kind of utilitarian and um, socialist way of, 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 of getting rid of what was then 19th century slums which had grown up um, as a result of the Industrial Revolution. 
Um, and the idea was to, you know, make affordable housing that, that was modern and much more efficient. But then the way that these buildings by um, the 1990s had rotted from the inside and their, the cheapness of their construction had created things like the whole issue of the bathroom cabinets that led to the other bathroom cabinets with no dividing wall. And that, by the way, was an architectural feature of the apartment, Cabrini Green. The fact that they built the apartments in cinder block and didn't even plaster them, they were building slums. And then when they decided that, that the whole complex was too close to downtown Chicago and that, that part of it was across the railway tracks, the wrong place in Sandburg, which, which is where they, they then took the same buildings and they plastered they put a little stub plaster over the cinder block and sold them as condos, and that's what happens in the movie. That's true. I didn't invent that. That's something that I discovered when I was uh, scouting in Chicago. And the murders that happened in Cabrini Green with the people coming through the bathroom cabinets because the bathroom cabinet just led to the bathroom cabinet, I didn't invent that either. That was something I actually... There's actually... When, when Helen goes into the um, university library and... Um, to research the, the murders, and she, she finds that thing, there's an article that says, who killed Ruth, Ruthie Jean, and there's a picture of a dead woman on the floor, that comes up on her, her kind of uh, microfilm reader. Uh, that's not a piece, that's not a prop, that's not a fictional article, that was an article in the Chicago Reader about an actual series of murders that happened in Cabrini Green, where um, the assailant did actually gain access to people's apartments through the bathroom window. So, you know, to me, I know it's a slightly long-winded answer. We have time for one more question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will, now, I, I will now, I'm now going to continue my lecture and talk about the semi -op. The slides are coming up yes. soon. <laughs> anyway, there you go. I'll shut up. That's, that's, absol that's actually absolutely terrifying that that's true. I didn't even know that. That's, that's horrifying that, that people crawl through you know, Man. I always, when I'm making an RFM, I'm always, always quite subconscious about the idea of copycat killings, so I'd rather copycat real murders, so it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of creepy. Um, so <laughs> so for, the, um, for the actors here, I'm curious what you thought when you read this script and what really grabbed you about it, because it's, it was such a, a beautiful concept, it's such a neat the mythology comes to life, and they thrive on that belief. What did you think when you first read this script? We'll start with Ted. Well, <laughs> all right, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess so, I guess I'm, I guess I'm one of the first ones. Um, well, it's a brilliant script, there's no doubt about it. Um, it is ingenious and original, uh, made uh, all the more so by Bernard's hand in directing it, and uh, Xander and Tony uh, starring in the picture, there's no doubt about it. So it was really a no-brainer for me at that point. Um, I was just really excited to work with any of these guys, so I probably would have done a porno at that point. <laughs> <laughs> they were, oh, we did, that's right, Bernard, I forgot. Uh, Bernard, had previously, I met Bernard not on that picture, but on a previous comedy short that I did with him for the Playboy channel. <laughs> uh, so in fact, we did meet on a porno. That is really true. It was a comedy short that uh, Bernard directed and I, I was in. Uh, at that time, Playboy was trying to branch out into comedy. I don't know why. No, they weren't. They weren't. They, they, they weren't. 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 They uh, so that, there was that, and, um, um, and later, so of course, I, I, it wasn't surprising that I, I died in that picture. I die in most pictures I'm in, so that was not a surprise when I read that. Um, but it was weird that in another Clive Barker picture, many years later, I died too. So I don't know what Clive Barker has against me, but apparently he doesn't like me very much. Um, but that, that was about it, so I was, I was very, very lucky, and I feel uh, very fortunate now, and you never know if a picture is going to have legs or not. Bert and I were talking about this earlier. You you make the best movie that you can as an actor, and I'm sure 
Bernard and these other fine actors next to me probably feel the same way. And you hope and pray that in years to come, people will still want to rent it and buy it and own it. Um, sometimes you think you're making the greatest thing and then, you know, six months later, no one knows what you did. And other times, as in this instance, it's uh, decades and decades go by and people really love it. And um, I'm very lucky. Am I next? You're next. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, much of what Ted was saying. Um, it was a great script, and uh, it was a great part. He had a great script, and as soon as I met Bernard, I knew that, obviously, just reading the script, you could tell it was coming from a great mind. And I'd seen his movie, Paper House, which to me, uh, was emblematic of a new genre of horror film, which I called smart art horror. And I was, I'm, an, I'm an artist, a, a visual artist as well as an actor, and so just anything that attains to the level of art, and I knew that he had Philip Glass doing the music from the start, so already that elevates it. All of these, these ideas that an urban legend could then sort of work its way into the psyche because there's something about all urban legends that some part of our, they become an urban legend because there's a, a hole in the psyche that affects collectively um, your belief that it could be true at the same time as it's a legend. It's not true. But there's something enough to it to keep it generating a, a, an ever-growing audience of belief that it could be true. And so I thought that was such a, a, a cool idea for the genesis of a, of a horror film. And to have a professor who is a semiotics professor in one of my opening scenes giving a lecture to the class about this subject. And it's, it, it just, uh, everything about it was pulling me in from the minute I started reading it. And it was one of those times that you knew while you're doing it this is probably going to have an impact. It was a, a lower budget movie. I did Terminator 2 the same year, and that was a huge movie that you could also just, you knew it was going to be around. You knew he was going to beat the odds and spend more money than anybody ever had on a film, but probably win the war of getting a bigger audience than anybody had ever had for a movie. And this was, uh, I was going back and forth at the time between some smaller roles in huge movies to larger roles in smaller movies. And this was a great step up for me to play a, a, a main character in which was a, a very important smaller budget film, but still a wish. I, I, I grew up in the, in, the, in the golden era of independent film and I didn't realize it until about 2008 when it just, the bottom dropped out altogether and they stopped making $10 million movies. It had to be 125 million or 250,000, and so I, I, I'm nostalgic for this film and the experience we had collectively making it, and for that period when people would put up money, like propaganda films did, to make a film like this. Well, because I think you had all the money you needed to make it as good as it could be, and it was a perfect film for what it was. To make. So I imagine that a director would probably say, "There's never enough." Money. Sure. Yeah, since you know we could have all made a little bit more off on the day. Hello. It's a funny little tripod. It's like a little puppet. <laughs> Tony. Um, third and second emotion of everybody that has spoken before. It is an art smart movie. It is a movie that raised the level of independence. People told me when I told my friends and my professors and I was taking this role, they said, why are you doing it? Uh, is it going to make fun of a black man in a situation that's raised in the yellow? And I said, not if I can help it. They said, you'll never live it down. You'll, um, you may never get cast again in anything. And I said, I'm going to do my damnest to make sure that doesn't happen. As soon as I read the script and I saw the scenes with the bees and I found out it was in the cast, I knew that for all the woolly bests in the world, for all the step and fetches in the world, for all the man tan Moreland's in the world, and I had to do something that had the classes dignity. And I tried my best to, uh, in spite of the horrific incidents, in spite of Chicago, which even today 
has one of the highest murder rates in the country. And God bless everybody on the anniversary of 9 11, by the way. Remember where you were. One of the things I've been able to be empowered by playing this mythical role of being surrounded, you know, Xander and I have worked together before this little uh, unknown movie called Driven, if you must find. Ted and I have worked in New Zealand before. That's right. Um, you know, movies, one day the planet may dissolve and all the cinema may burn, but we all have experiences in the work that we do. There are some movies that we work on with big budgets that they pay us a lot of money that last temporarily one year, two years, and are forgotten. Candyman is uh, past 25 years, and we're able to attend horror adventures, conventions like this, or even when we're shopping at Bonds, or Ralph's, or Gelson's, or whatever, people still come up exactly when we're in the toilet paper aisle. <laughs> and say, you know, I know you from somewhere, don't know where, but <laughs> I know you're not a thief or a gang member. No, I'm not. Um, this film for me is one of the most important roles I've ever taken. I didn't know it at the time. I just, Bernard kept telling me when we were hanging out in Chicago at the Kings and Mines, a great blues bar, this is going to be forever. It's going to be forever as he pulled his hair. And I said, well, I, I don't know if it's forever, but I'm going to do my damnedest to, to show up on set and come time and come prepared. And, but he was right. I don't know why. I'm still trying to figure it out. But I do know that I've been approached by people that have written doctorates on the film. Uh, there's over a hundred theses that were written on this film. And the thing that disturbs me sometimes, and people say, oh, you scare me, and that's okay, I, I guess it did scare you, but the film was much deeper than that. It had to be. It's a resonant film that sort of examines our racial conflicts in America and where we are, and God help us. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're right, that's one thing that I took away from this movie, watching it, was the, just how deep it is and how you have a, your, your character isn't really a villain in a lot of ways, he's a tragic character. Yeah, it's a gothic uh, circumstance that this happened. Yes, you know, Virginia Madsen, who is probably had the most lines. Lyrically absent here today at the yeah. past. <laughs> she has another appointment to attend, but I think she's still scared of Bernie. You know, Bernie, you want to talk about that hypnotism stuff that you did? It is actually, to be fair to Virginia, it is actually her birthday today. And I don't oh. Probably why she's not here. And, and I know, I, I remember she was very upset after 9 11 happened that it seemed like her birthday had been ruined forever, which I mean, it's, it's kind of awful in that way. Um, but so I, that's she how I remember. She was the end of the film. She, yeah. she, oh, no, absolutely. The film is about, it, it's from her point of view. Yeah. Because she's. That lovely final scene with you, the revelation, and the girlfriend. You kind of played I'll come a dick. <laughs> Getting a little on the side, like any <laughs> good <laughs> professor would. <laughs> you know, she was cute. Yeah. And of course, it, it, tell the story, Bernard, because I think you, you had a, a test screening at one point, because I remember Bernard say, uh, they've all seen the movie, and they want to see you die. <laughs> and it wasn't in the original script. It wasn't in the script. Wow. Originally. Go, they, they want me to die just for fucking the girl? Well, actually, <laughs> funny enough, it was one of those odd situations where the original end of the movie was it, was, it was the same ending, but it was somewhat more poetic in the, as much as the, the way the movie originally ended is the shot that's now under the credits, the camera went up to the crack in the wall, and then it went through the, if you look at that shot, it now just goes onto her eyes, but actually to the left of her, there's a sort of big gash in the plaster, and the camera went through the gap in the plaster, and, and you found Virginia's burned body but walled up behind the painting, and the end was that she sort of came to life and that was the end. So it was a sort of more poetic version of the same thing. 
And actually, prior to that, I originally had a scene where, in, in the original draft before that, which was what we shot originally, um, there was um, a scene, I did have a scene where Trevor actually invoked her, and, and, and she came back and killed Trevor. So that was sort of, it was sort of a reversion to the original ending. Because um, I remember when, when, I, when I originally had the script like that, they, they, they were all, people were concerned that it was, it was too, um, it was too much of a sort of genre-style ending. But by the time, as you say, the audience were hyped up and they were wanting that, that they wanted your blood. They wanted some vengeance. And, and their getting hopped up got him so hopped up. It was, it was, it was a moment I'll never forget. So she's gonna rip you stand to stern, mate. So it's gonna be gouts and gouts of blood. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, and you had that little tank, that little air pressure thing. Oh yeah, no, they're good those. Split open and they didn't know, you know, having my carcass opened up in the bathroom, I'm like, yeah, we get it. <laughs> and, and he's just there with this tank, like, oh, gouts and gouts. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I hate those movies. You know those movies where they say things, you know, they go, you know, I'd rather let the audience imagine. I'd rather not show it all. I like to see it all. <laughs> I fucking hate PG-13 horror films. <laughs> they, I mean, what, what's the point? If a horror film can't be transgressional, it shouldn't be made. And, you know, anyway, that's just my view. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact that when I saw this movie, when it originally came out, they started counting her name at the end of the theater with, everybody started counting that's her right. name when you were saying it. Well, I remember the very, <laughs> the very, very first test screening. <clears throat> it was very funny <clears throat> um, uh, because at the time, when I finished the film, everybody involved in the production, they honestly, I think they thought it was too arty, and they thought it was too, they didn't think it was really a mainstream film. So they thought, oh, we'll take it to a test screening, it will do horribly, and then we can like go in and, and hack, it, hack it to pieces and turn it into, you know, an 80s slasher picture. Um, so, so we went to this test screening and it was somewhere in Orange County in, in, a, in a sort of urban shopping mall and it was a very urban audience and, it, and, the, and it, this was back in the 90s when in fact when films were tested they, they looked much rougher than they do now because it was a cutting copy so cutting, you know, we used to go in the cutting room and clean up the fucking dirt and shit off it, but it was still had joins all the way through it, so they would bounce every time, and it would bounce and it would be all covered in crap, you know? And, and the opticals weren't in it, and, and, and you'd do a temp mix, but it was, it was pretty crude, and I remember the film started, and there were no titles on it at the time, because, you know, nowadays, obviously, it's just in any, you know, on your telephone, you can superimpose titles, but back then it was, um, you know, you had to go to a, it was a process and it cost money, so you didn't do it until you knew that was how it was going to be. Um, so the film began with a three minute helicopter shot of Chicago with Philip Glass music. And so there was this audience in there, like, just basically talking to each other. And it was like the movie hadn't even really started. They were just, they, it was like, <laughs> they had, had no interest for anybody. I could see that. It was, it, was, it, was, it looked like kind of scarcity, basically. Had started. It was, <laughs> I mean, it was exactly the same as, as Kyle Scott. I liked it. Um, anyway, and then the film started, and there's a scene with Ted, and, and he's in the bathroom, and um, and and the girl says to him, "Have you ever heard of Candy Man?" You look in the mirror, and you say his name five times. The other appear behind you. Oh, you know. And so there, there was still people weren't even slightly quiet. They were talking to each other. They weren't even watching the movie. So, they, so he looks in the mirror and he starts to say, I mean, he said it the first time, and then it was slightly quieter. And he said it the second time, and it was like, they settled down a little, I would say, but they were still talking. And the third time, it was like, they, they showed up. By the time it got to the fifth time, there was silence. And, it was, and, then, and, then, they, and then they jumped, and they had the first jump, and Tony took the fist. And I remember seeing, I the producer sitting next to me, and I was like, Paint him on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was good. I was lucky. 
Phew, if it had gone the other way, who knows what might have happened. Well, I think we're going to um, pass it out to the crowd for questions now. So if you want to find this fine gentleman with the microphone, raise your hand and he'll come to you. Hi, guys. Um, thank you for coming. It's awesome to see you guys. Um, but for my question, it's mostly for Bernard and Tony. Um, you know, you're talking about like, the subtext of the film and like, the doctoral thesis and things like that. So it's kind of serious, uh, curious if you kind of like elaborate that uh, it can like almost start as a white savior. Like this woman comes into Caperny Green, and eventually, you know, all these things happen, and like it tears her down, and it's like kind of subverts that, like where you know, um, you know, like her life and like the classism, and like starts uh, tearing down. Um, you know, she's getting down to a lower level, but then it still seems like she saves the day. So it's kind of curious to kind of elaborate, like how it, maybe like that white savior thing kind of comes up, or maybe you were trying to address it, or what have you. Well, I think I think the the point is is that, as you say, that the whole issue when she goes in there at the first, she goes in there with uh, Casey Lemons, who's you know middle class uh, African American woman, and the, the the social divide between Casey's character and uh, the Anne Marie, the woman who's in in Cabrini Green with her baby, is as bigger gulf as the racial divide. And I think that's why, you know, which is going back to the original story, which is that really poverty is what creates a social divide and the fear more than anything else. And um, I think that's, that's sort of the point of the film. And, that's, and in, in, the, in the sense that the adaptation was done that way originally, uh, well, that's how it is in the short story. So I think that that's the basic thesis of the film. Uh, you know, it, you know, it's like the, it's the old joke of the film, um, the old um, Stanley Crane film, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, when which was famous for being the first film about an interracial relationship. You know, Sidney Poitier comes in and he's like a fucking surgeon. I mean, who doesn't want their daughter to marry a doctor? So the film is kind of ridiculous. So in one sense, and I think that's the point. Well, I mean, to modernize, it seems ridiculous. Because you go, well, he's so perfect. And he's so, you know. So, so in that sense, he, he, the, uh, the social divides are about money as much as, more than they are about race. And I think that's the point of the film. You know, if you look at the title of the original short story, which is Forbidden, and that for me was a theme for me, talking about Caitlin's original character, Granville, uh, was an elegant man. He wasn't, he wasn't poor at all. He was a successful artist. Uh, it was interesting me over the years, people come up to me and say, you know, you have to look at this film more than once because it's not just a boogeyman. And I strive to make sure that it wasn't just that. It's not just a, you know, a gangster from or someone that you fear or, or dare not tread. Um, this is a person that was lynched. He was a victim of slavery, and he was lynched for falling in love with someone that he wasn't supposed to be in love with. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, whether you know it or not, I think that's what strikes a deep chord in this film. And going back to the source, the forbidden, what exactly? not supposed to have uh, crossing over to a side, the side of the street that you're not supposed to, or dare not tread. Um, but at the end of the day, we had fun making this film. And I think we're all proud of it. Um, I know I am, uh, even though I'm very thoughtful about it. Uh, I remember Casey Lemon's husband uh, told me, you'll never live this down. And I said, well, fuck you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we carry on. But work is work, and this wasn't just a job. This was a this was a task and a calling. And I'm honored to be part of a distinguished company. And uh, maybe 50 years from now, people will stop uh, talking about it. I hope not. Let's light this shit up.
Let's get some cool in the gang in the house. This is Hollywood swinging. Or Funkadelic. Free your mind and your ass will follow. This is the best panel ever. <laughs> but it will be. Work, but that's one of the more underrated horror movies of all time. And further point to that, so is Candyman. So here's my question, guys. All right, cool. Uh, uh, <laughs> Candyman, without a doubt, is uh, one of the stronger, like like Ben in A Nightmare, or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, A Night of the Living Dead, like Ben, he's one of the stronger African-American characters in the, in the history of cinema, not just horror movies in general. Uh, so, uh, Bernard, this question is more for you. Uh, can you talk about like the uh, the racial the racial we've been talking about race the whole time the uh, the racial implications of the film and how that affected financing uh, you know particularly did you did they give you the producers or I'm sorry the, uh, the financiers or whatever were you given less money because they were worried about how you know Cabrini Green Chicago they were worried about like you know uh, it not selling you know the backdrop of early 90s is without a doubt one of the more Racially tensional, you know, tension-based uh, times of you know, in culture. Did that actually affect the financing of the film? Well, it, it affected the final test screening of the film because I remember I was when we finally had the whole thing we, as it was we were describing earlier. We I did actually reshoot the ending, and um, I then was supposed to test it again. And then the, the Rodney King riots happened. Remember those in LA? And, and then the producers were too terrified to show it to anybody, and, I, and that was kind of fun. And I thought, well, and so, and so we locked the picture without ever doing another screening, actually, which was actually probably a good thing. Because I think, you know, as you, as you rightly say, in, in, in the atmosphere of that era, especially in Los Angeles, it was um, kind of, it was something that was viewed a little, as, 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 as they weren't sure what it meant, so they weren't sure what they had to say about it. And that was from different people from different spectrums and different sides of, of that divide. But the thing that I want to point out, which, which I think is... Tell them about the, uh, you know, the NAACP. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I will, but I think the first thing I want to say, I think it's really significant, is that when we made Candyman, um, yeah, there were people in pre-production who, 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 who were objecting to the idea of it, and, and, there were, and there were discussions that I had with people from the NAACP. As Tony was saying uh, about the film, because there were, there were people who were concerned about it, so, so we, we discussed it. But my argument was then and is now: is Are you saying that this kind of role can only be played by a white man? Because if you're saying that, you're saying that the boogeyman can only be white. <coughs> are you saying that the Children on Halloween can only dress up as a white boogeyman. So that's basically what you're saying at that point, and that's wrong. Yeah, it, 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 anybody should be able to play any role. And I think what what I think people always forget with a horror film is there is a weird transference that happens with whoever is the horror villain. Because as we were discussing, the film is about Virginia's character. She's the lead character in the film. She takes up the vast majority of the screen time. Tony barely appears in the first half. Ten minutes. Yeah, barely appears in it. And yet, Tony is who the film is about. <laughs> Tony and and Tony is 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 what you can take away from the film. And there is a, a weird transference that happens with horror villains: is that you're afraid of them and then you identify with them, which is why horror sequels to horror films never work. Because by the second one, they've either become a comedian like Freddy, or um, they just have to kill more people, and so there's literally nowhere to take the story. Um, and so, the point is, is that he's, they become a sort of hero. They become oddly iconic and they become heroic because they become something that people and children identify with. Um, so my question now, this is, film is 24 years ago. It was actually premiered at the Toronto Film Festival exactly 1992. So it's exactly uh, 24 years ago. Um, so 
I thought we were 25. I thought we were celebrating 25. No, it's 24. 24. 92. I like 24 too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, my question is, it's 24 years ago in this film, and if Tony was the first African-American horror villain, what to me is shocking is that 24 years later, he's still the only. Right. That's wrong. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. You know, I have a question I'd love to ask, because I think by being British, your perspective on race is different, and uh, because you didn't have what we did in the way of the Civil War as a defining moment in your history. It was something much subtler, and in Europe in general, race relations are different than they are in the States. And you could say that it's, it's about poverty, more than race, and I think it's so interesting. But I think, as I was hearing Tony talk, I was reminded of what I felt when I first saw the film, which is the, the primordial fear of the white man in the South, that I have got to always try and figure out what the fuck they're thinking <laughs> when it comes to being racist in this day and age and with what we're going through in the political, world today and how racist things are being thrown around like are you primitive idiots still thinking this way and it's so why what is your fear and why are you and and i feel like the fact that Candyman was from slavery and was lynched and is so tall and is has this incredibly deep voice and these massive hands he strikes an archetypal fear in i think what is more the racist, white, southern, white, male mind of, they're gonna burn down the plantation and fuck our women and take it all away from us. <laughs> and that's somewhere at the core of the fear that this film, I think, does such a brilliant job of addressing without, and it's interesting to hear you say it because it's, it's the, you're saying it's poverty, but I think in America, part of the reason why racism still thrives to the extent that it does is because that's a primordial fear, and it comes from conditioning. I don't know if that's too too uh, racy to ask, but <laughs> I'd love to get your take on it. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I I know you that you guys. Okay, it's interesting that Rodney King was around when we opened. Yeah. When the second film opened, what was it? It was OJ. Okay, and I remember being on a press junket trying to promote Candyman 2, and all of a sudden they called me and said, all they wanted to ask me was, what do you think about OJ? And it really freaked me out because like, I don't know him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm a football fan. Uh, I've dated all kinds of women, but uh, never killed anybody for real. <laughs> <laughs> thought about a few directors that could be better. <laughs> <laughs> the knuckles slap, but not killing, you know? And, uh, <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you something, like, I love you guys at the work business. You guys give me nothing but unconditional love. For some reason, you, you love this film, I'm still trying to figure out why. But the deepest people that really love this film are people that live in projects, housing projects, all over this country. God bless Cabrini Green, which is no longer here, but we still have projects in St. Louis. I don't know why. And, 2016 that we still have these small little apartments with big flat screen TVs and no way to escape. But those, are, and I've been able to, over the years, to work as a gang interventionist because gangs, this is their favorite film. And I'm trying to figure out why you, because, because you kill motherfuckers. <laughs> and they go, but that's not the point. Oh man, we identify because it's like, dude, and, uh, and, but I get them to talk about it, and then I'm able to try to address and get different groups of gangs together and have a, a reasonable dialogue so that we don't have black-on-black uh, -black crime or white-on-white -white crime or anybody-on-anybody -anybody crime. Uh, art saves us. I know I came from a lower middle class background, saved by my aunt who gave me programs every summer to get onto, and one day, one summer, she gave me drama. From that moment on, I knew that that was what I was going to do for the rest of my life, particularly theater. Uh, when I get to work with dramatists like August Wilson or people that have things meaningful to say, and if you listen to the three-hour dirge, you, you get to maybe have a new perspective. 
But I love Candyman. I don't regret it. I don't want you to try to walk away thinking that I hate him. I'm glad that I've been able to not be pigeonholed and stereotyped, and I've done a vast body of work, particularly on stage. And, uh, you know, we have films that we say, why did I do that, or why did I make that choice? In Candyman, with Bernard's help and guidance and the surrounding cast, people that didn't just show up to take a paycheck, to show up trying to make the best of whatever character they had, to tell the story like they did with opening the film, like Xander did with just playing it without, with ease, with beauty, with entirety. That's what we see, and um, I thank you for that. Candyman is not looking for vengeance. He's looking for love. And you know, you, you, you in, the, the secret of the Candyman is you only get him if you invoke him. And the, and the invocation part of it is, you know, he, he only goes where he, where he wants it, in that sense. He, and um, I think, you know, it, it, that, that was part of the whole concept of the, of the idea that, that, that if he didn't exist, it would be necessary to invent him. And that when, when the people in, in Cabrini are told, no, the can there is no canny man, it's just a, a drug dealer who's been arrested. There's, there's, there's like the, the little boy and he's, he's so disappointed. It's because, because despite the horror of his life, it's the need to believe there's something worse out there. It's uncontrollably evil or difficult or dangerous. And I think, and that's why he's, seductive candy man because he's also um he's real proof and contact with um something metaphysical which is of course the real reason people like ghost stories and horror films is because they want to feel that there is something beyond uh, something supernatural that's real and, and the super Something supernatural that frightens you in a horror film is more concretely manifested in the movie than it is in real life. And I think that's the, the heart of the appeal of a horror film. The one thing I kind of took away from the ending of Candyman was you sort of saved her in a weird way. You empowered her at the end of that movie because yeah. you were all she had left. And then she got you back at the end. <laughs> but because of what you gave her, which was her own power back. She had to die for it, but she found it. Well, he invokes her, don't forget. Yeah, true. And, but in a way, it's, in a way, it's uh, how she becomes the way, the power that he gives her. So it's, it's an eternal, too, just like Candyman. Uh, so going back to the NAACP, and, and, no, seriously, just because this is bothering me my entire life. W.E. Du Bois, we call this the go along to get along Negroes, right? They told me that I would be banned for life for ever getting an image award for doing this part, which I find ridiculous thinking. And it is my goal one day to play O.J. Simpson. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Bill Cosby. Yeah, but I'll do some pudding pops. <laughs> This is the best panel ever. <laughs> and you, you did forget <laughs> Black Hula. I see that roll out. I said, why do I do that? No, think of it. And I'm thinking about it. I said, maybe there's something in there. Yeah, maybe there's something in there. You can think that is Yeah, I like it. I know I started out playing bad guys in Hollywood because even in the, uh, in, in 1980, um, there was already a sense of political correctness that Latinos and Blacks shouldn't be cast as the villains. And, and I looked at it, I'd come from the theater, and there were all these TV shows, and they needed another bad guy every week. Every week. And I thought, that's steady work. Yeah. And I'll take my, my theater chops, and I'll make each one talk differently and have different afflictions and different psychoses. And, you know, there were all, all variety of psychos that I played as I learned how to deal with cameras. As my school, I was getting paid a little too learn how to work with cameras, but my aim was always film. And it, it's so interesting because I, I thought about it back then and it felt like it needed to be, you know, just like we needed to have 
the, you know, the cowboys not always be the, the good guys in the cowboy and Indians movies. We needed to have blacks and Latinos not playing the villain all the time, uh, the bad guy. And so I, I, I stepped up and took advantage of that. But it's, it is weird that to this day, there is such a stigma about letting political correctness does drive us on, and, and especially in Hollywood, we are slaves, if I can use the expression, to their dictates about what you can and cannot do. And it's really, when, if, if you're supposed to be, it's a free country and who better to be free than artists? to say and be iconoclastic, and, and like you were saying, it should be. That's why we need to read Dessart. We need to read more Dessart, because he'll, get, he'll blow that out of your mind. Yeah, see, we were born of Puritans and Libertines coming from Great Britain. Now, that's what happened, is, is that the British, we, we, we took the whores and the thieves and we sent them to Australia, and we sent the religious <laughs> maniacs to America. <laughs> that makes so much sense now. <laughs> They're all descended from religious mania. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting working on a friend of mine had been a, uh, in horror for years and had been toiling and not getting uh, many opportunities. He finally got a TV series, the show Salem, and he's one of my oldest friends in LA. And uh, he wanted me to do the first season of it for him and with him. And it was a really interesting investigation, and it was my mother was was uh, lost her last year at 102. She had me in her 40s, and it was it, it allowed us to have a dialogue about something because she was brought up in Texas, and that her father was a Puritan. We knew, and she rebelled against that and went on a spiritual journey in search and had a, an incredible life, and was still so vital. Never lost a marble. 102. But we had this conversation when she was 101, when I was doing, or 100, when, when, when I was doing Salem, about the fact that we are born of both Puritans and witches that left Great Britain to a great extent, because before there was Christianity in the British Isles, there was earth sciences in the form of, uh, you know, herbal remedies and all the rest of these were things that they did magic and the stone circles are there from the Druid days, and there were, there were traditions that existed in, in Great Britain that many people felt, this is my roots, this is my, you can't take that away, but they were being burned at the stake in Great Britain at the time, so to avoid religious persecution from the extreme left, in a way, because they were libertines, they did have different sexual morals, and from the extreme right, the Puritans came over, and we are this interface between these two kind of like warring tribes, and that sort of also explains a little bit why we have this red state, blue state, psychoses and, and uh, schism in the country. And I think it's in all of us on a certain level. That, and my mother, it, it, when we had the conversation, was, because there were indications, and I did a lot of very weird things when I went to Texas as a kid, from my mother's side of the family, on her mother's side of the family, and it's only revealed that, that she, uh, she goes, well, I guess you're right, my mother was a witch. And she had not been a Puritan in Texas and had been carrying on traditions of seances and other things of contact and all the rest of it that had its roots in, in witchcraft, as we came to call it, sort of the dark term. But, I think that it's interesting. It would, for me, that made Salem a fascinating project. And I think part of what makes Candyman still so vital is that it does explore those questions. And on some level about our puritanical roots, our <coughs> magical roots, and our uh, inability to sort of come to terms, especially with, with race. So I think we have time for one more question. This, yes, yes, Ted, you're, are you going to be our last question? I, I have a question. Yes, uh, this question is directed towards Bernard, and I would like to know. I never could figure this out. How the hell did you get Philip Breaking Glass, who, to score the movie? It was the most. It was the craziest thing. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Bernard, was this? Is this not maybe the third or? fourth score he had ever written. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, basically what happened was um, <clears throat> one of the producers was a man called Alan Poole, who was 
um, had been a, uh, an associate producer on Mishima, the Paul Schrader film, which Philip scored. And um, I was talking to Alan at one point, and, and um, he said, who, who do you, what do you want to do with the music? And I said, well, I want to get somebody like Philip Glass. And Alan went, oh, I know Philip. So I said, well, call the fucker up. <laughs> um, and um, so he did. And he said, well, you know, Philip's coming to town. We, we, we had an assembly of the film, um, very rough assembly. And again, you have to remember, post-production in the analog era was a very, be on 35 on mag. And, and when there were bits where there was supposed to be music or effects, it would literally just be bits of picture film there cut into the tape. So it would just go silent in the screening. And then someone would speak, and then it would be silent again. And obviously, Philip wanted to view the film without any temp score of any kind on it. And I would never be so rude as to run a film for a composer with temp music on it. Um, Wait, side question. What did you temp the movie with? Nothing. It was, there was no music on it. But Philip came in. This is an assembly. It wasn't even a cut. It was a really long assembly. So it was very slow. No sound effects. Just bits of dialogue. No music. And Philip watched this, and it, and it probably was half an hour longer than the finished film. And um, Philip watched this, and he loved it. He, and he was like, oh, no, it's great. No. And uh, so he, he went back to New York, and he, he wrote me like a suite of music, which he then had Michael Reisman demo. And, and, he, and like, so about 10 days later, I got cassettes in the mail from Philip, which had, had all the music on it. I was like, this is great. So I cut the movie using Philip's demos, basically. Uh, we discussed the instrumentation. We discussed that it was going to be just organ, voices, and piano, and nothing else. And he liked that. You know, he was always a minimalist. And um, so he, he went away. He did the music. He sent it to me. I cut the film with the music. And we did 10 mixes with his demos and everything. And then when we came to the, the finished version of the music, Michael Reisman came in and we showed him where we cut the music up as well as how we'd used it. And he went, a bit, went away and he rearranged it to fit the movie now. With not much, because we cut it pretty minimally, actually. And, um, and then he recorded it with Philip's normal band, the Philip Glass Ensemble. And um, which they recorded in New York. I didn't attend the sessions. Um, you're not allowed to, Philip. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but typically, when you cut pictures, yeah. uh, the picture is cut, and then the composer composes only to that picture. That's correct. But I, in this case, that wasn't true, was it? Absolutely not. Philip wrote a suite, which I then used as temp music, and it, it informed the cut. But I, and then, and then, he, and then we, we re-recorded it with, with, in, with players rather than just it was just, uh, you know, some kind of uh, synth demo. Um, and um, I wish I had those original demos. They were, anyway, I don't. Um, but anyway, so he, he did that. And, um, I, I, and he didn't see the film. Philip didn't see the film finished. We mixed it, and then of course all the sound effects in it. And I deliberately wanted all the jump scares and all the fat, scary stuff to be done with sound effects, not with music, because I think when you have a scene that's supposed to be scary, if you have the scary music comes in, it not only is not scary, it's definitely, it's the most not scary thing in the world. Um, and so, it, you know, silence is what's scary in a film. So we did all that. All that stuff was just done. Can you talk about the sound, the sound mix and the concepts that you had after? Yeah, no, well, and, and the sound was very much a sort of music concrete thing with sort of unpleasant and subsonic sounds. but but. The, the mix was done, the film was finished, and it was running in Times Square in New York, not far from where Philip has his studio in um, New York. And so Philip got a bunch of his fancy friends together <laughs> and took them to a screening. Um, you know, Philip, who at the time was known for operas and Kyan and, you know. <laughs> So he, he took his friends to this, this film and he came out of the movie and I think, I don't think they enjoyed it very much. <laughs> <laughs> and
And he came out of the movie and he called Alan. Um, he didn't call me, he called Alan. And he yelled at him. And he said, you, what have you done to this movie? It's a horror film. And he was, he was appalled. Uh, and, and for years, he, when people would, he had the rights to the music, people would say, can you put the soundtrack out? And he would went, no! I, I'm shocked I ever did this film. He was, he was, he was, he was freaked out by it. He didn't, he didn't like the movie. Probably his fancy friends. There's his fancy friends. He didn't like the movie, and he, and he thought, he thought, he, he thought what he'd seen was this really interesting art house film. Well, he'd seen it without any sound, and it was half an hour longer, you know. And then, and then somehow it had been turned into this horror film, and he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, um, he didn't like it. But years later, many years later, in 2009, um, I was making a film called Mr. Nice, which was about Howard Marks, the guy who invented the marijuana business. And out of the blue, I was contacted by somebody from Philip Glass's office. I hadn't spoken to him since then. Right? He contacted me and he said, um, you know, Philip wants to do the score of your movie. Right. Okay. <laughs> so I just said, yeah, sure, great, why not? Because, you know, I love Philip, I love his music. And so I went to New York to meet with him and, and, and with his film and, and we just got, it was just a script and we talked about what he was going to do and he had to do all sorts of things and he was telling me how he was Ravi Shankar's assistant in the 60s and all this stuff. And, a Ravi Shankar didn't know that his audiences were smoking dope. It was very funny. Um, so, so he, so, so, so we had this conversation, and, and he was going to do the film. And, 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 and in the middle of it, I just said to him, "Look, Philip, there's something I've got to ask you, which is, what's what's your problem with the Kenny Man soundtrack? What, what, why is it not available um, on CD or disc or whatever?" And he went. Yeah, mm. yeah, and he sort of wouldn't answer me. <laughs> and, um, and I said, come on, you've got to tell me what it was. And, I, and he said, well, he said, I was just being stupid. That was all he would tell me, I was just being stupid. I said, okay, fine. So, so why, why did your office call me and say you wanted to do this film? And he said, well, he said, I was at my accountant's office and they went through all the residuals I'd received from all the different films over the years. <laughs> I was shocked! <laughs> How much money I'd made. So then, then Philip, put, he did put the soundtrack out. But he's, he's a very sweet guy, Philip. He's a brilliant composer. And in fact, I wanted to score my next film. I think he's, I, for my money, he's the best. And you know, he doesn't work in a conventional way. You can't use him the way you use Hans Zimmer or, you know, he doesn't have a factory of elves working for him. <laughs> um, well, I think, I think we're about ran out of time. Actually, my mic, I think, died. But I want to thank you guys so much. This has been an awesome, awesome